दिल्ली He is also known for frameless stereotactic navigation work in cases of epilepsy caused by small lesions which are close to eloquent area of brain. His stereotactic radio surgery is another area in which he has done the largest number of cases at the Apollo Hospital, Delhi. He is actively involved in neurosurgical training and research work at Apollo Hospital. So I present to you Dr. Sudhir Tyagi. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Tyagi. जो बोले तो उस पर थोड़ी देर करते हैं जब स्लाइड शो होगा फिर पूरी स्लाइड आ जाएगी नहीं आएगी हाँ तो ठीक है गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन इट्स ए बिग अपॉर्चुनिटी टू इंटरेक्ट यू विद ऑल ऑफ यू अगेन बिकॉज लाइट चेंज हो गई ना सर वेन एवर इट कम्स टू दी एम ई इन दिस एरिया आई आई थिंक नेवर सेड नो टू इट एंड द रीजन इज द पीपल आर वेरी इंटरेक्टिव आई नो few of them very well that they have their keep their questions ready after the talk and they make it really make it very interesting and that is the purpose of this cma so if we uh, when we come to the neurosurgery this is one of the branch which has seen the sea change in last 20 25 years i remember my college days when i was used to feel is scared going to the neurology or neurosurgery ward yeah. because people with a lot of deficits or not making after the surgery yeah, were the yeah, usual yeah. things when we were graduates but when i was doing ms surgery in king, king george medical college lucknow i started seeing the changes the microscopic surgery came and the results started changing so my mind drifted from urology to towards the neurosurgery i i was thinking of doing the urology but with doing the ms i changed my mind to go to the, go to the neurosurgery so when i came to the aims then i saw a lot of changes within few years the so many changes in the biomedical field and the biophysics which actually changed the results in the neurosurgery the problem of the neurosurgery was when we are going inside the brain or the spinal cord the problem was to chances of damaging the normal brain tissue or the spinal cord tissue neural tissue with the <coughs> development of the biophysics and the biomedical things we could save more and more neural tissue and remove the tumors and used to handle with the aneurysm av malformations without damaging the neural tissue and remove the intramedullary spinal tumors so there has been tremendous progress in the modern day technology causing a rapid evolution in the department of neurosurgery ab ka kya hai slide pe focus one of the major change came in the result of the brain tumor surgery was the neuro navigation when i was studying in the aims we didn't have the neuro navigation the first time i was introduced to neuro navigation in apollo hospital new delhi in year 
the all over the India there was no new navigation okay. technique. Okay. This was the first hospital in the New Delhi, which okay. came with the new okay. navigation. So they started using new navigation in the new 1997, which causes leads to a precise localization of the deep seated brain tumors and helping the accurate operation of the affected regions without seeing the normal brain tissue. Such preciseness helps in the improvement of and the good patient outcome. I will show you some cases which are close to the eloquent areas like this is the tumor which is very close to the motor area. So when we go here, if we don't have the neural navigation and we make the craniotomy, we can go here or there cutting the normal tissue and find, trying to find the brain tumor. But because I have a neural navigation, I know where, how much bone I have to cut just to reach the brain tumor without damaging the normal brain tissue. This is the beauty of the neural navigation. So I am removing the tumor, keeping myself away from the normal brain tissue, which is the motor area in this case, and I am saving the patient from getting hemiparesis or hemiplasia. Is another patient like this. So the main primitivities in the brain are localization of small tumors and especially in the area of the eloquent areas and the skull base surgeries. Intracellular biopsies also can be done very successfully with this and intracellular endoscopy can be guided by the neuro navigation. The functional neurosurgery and spinal navigation is also possible with this navigation system. This is one of the things which change the result. Another is ICG video angiography. In this case, when we have a vascular tumor which is have a lot of blood supply and it is tumor is in the important area of the brain. So we can monitor from where the blood supply is coming by doing this angiography intraoperatively. So when I am doing the microsurgery for a brain tumor, especially for the skull based tumors and the meningiomas, I can do this angiography and can see from where the blood supply is coming. This whole green area, if you see, is the area from where the blood supply is coming. So I already know when I am handling this tumor, how can I save the blood loss? And my surgical field will also be very clear and clean. So we can remove these tumors by handling the blood supply before entering into the tumor. We close the blood supply, coagulate it and remove the tumor easily. Usually I used to arrange four units of blood when I was in training. But with, the, with this kind of the facilities, with neuro navigation, video angiography, I usually arrange only one unit of blood or sometimes no blood I arrange during this for the surgery. Then when I am doing the aneurysm surgery, I am doing the video angiography after the clipping of the aneurysm. If the aneurysm is not clipped completely, the angiography will show intraoperatively that the aneurysm is still filling. So we can, I can adjust my clip accordingly. So this is the advantage of this. Next is awake craniotomy. I am doing it regularly, for, especially for my patient who had intractable epilepsy. The patient who has the epileptic focus or any small lesion which is causing epilepsy close to the speech area or the motor area, then we can have the awake craniotomy and along with this I do the motor mapping also, brief cortical mapping. And there is a special bipolar electrodes which I use for the stimulation of the cortex. The patient is conscious and I keep checking and stimulating the brain around that lesion. If the patient is talking to me and stop talking on the stimulation, I know this is the area which is the speech area. I have to go away from this. So I remove the tumor by saving the speech area and the motor area in this epileptic focus and the small lesions in these areas. The robotics in neurosurgery. Uh, I want to tell you guys, the robotics in neurosurgery is right now is not very successful. Reason is what robot is doing because everyone feels it is very fancy thing. Robot does wonderful job in the prostate surgery and the intra-abdominal surgeries and the thyroid surgeries. But when it comes to the neurosurgery, the I think that 
is there is still time to come when it will really help us to get more precision because it helps in making only the burr holes and doing the craniotomies precisely. But that can we can do already with the neural navigation. The another new uh, field is functional stereotactic neurosurgery, which I started doing at Apollo Hospital in the year 99. So I started with the stereotactic pallidotomies and thalamotomies for the movement disorders like Parkinson patients and patients with essential tremors and patients who are having dystonias. But with the time, the deep brain stimulation came. Because the problem with the pallidotomy and thalamotomy was reasoning was after two years or three years, the effects wear off. Then we have to do the again the surgery, which is the ablative surgery. We have to coagulate some part of the brain. With the deep brain stimulation, we are not damaging any part of the brain, just stimulating the particular part of the nucleus. So this is the area of the basal ganglia where you have different type of the nucleus, and one of them is subthalamic nucleus. So these are the areas which are of our interest for the patients who are having movement disorder like dystonia, essential tremors and Parkinson's disease. This is another technique where I am using for the functional histotactic neurosurgery is image fusion. In image fusion, we have the technique on our computer. The CT scan films and the MRI films can be fused because MRI shows good anatomy of the brain, better neuroanatomical definition and the spatial accuracy is more with the CT scan because of magnetic field spatial accuracy is not that good with the MRI. So we take the advantage of the, both the images in the spatial accuracy as well as the neuroanatomical definition. So we fuse these images. This is one of the images which we are getting fused with CT scan and the MRI. And on these images I calculate my targets for the particular diseases like in movement disorder, in dystonia, I have some different target, different nucleus which I have to target. And for the Parkinson's disease, this is a subthalamic nucleus with a very small nucleus of 7 to 8 millimeter, which I have to target. So this gives us precision. And that's how this is one of the patients in which I have put this uh, frame. After doing the MRI, with CT, putting this frame, I will do the CT scan and then I will fuse the images of the CT scan and the MRI and then I will uh, calculate the target X on X, Y, Z axis, three dimensionally. This is a, one of the pictures in which I have done the deep brain stimulation. These are the microelectrodes which reach to that particular nucleus very precisely. So we have to open the skull at two places, we are doing bilaterally and precisely localize this target and uh, implant this particular microelectrode on both the sides. This is one of my patients who had unilateral tremors. First of all, there was a difficulty in diagnosing what kind of tremor is this, but we have very good neurophysicians uh, back up with us in the Apollo hospital. One of my neurophysicians, Dr. Mukuruna, diagnosed it that it is a basically urinatal Parkinson's disease tremor. He has been to different places for last 20 years having these disabling tremors and not responding to any medical treatment. No, so we have done this uh, deep brain stimulation on the contralateral side in the subthalamic nucleus and we are switching on the battery which is lying in the subclavicular region which is connected to the brain in the microelectrode and we see how this stimulation will work when we are stimulating particular nucleus who is responsible for this trend. So this is one of my training who are learning, he is a neurophysician from actually Dubai who are learning the how to do the programming and stimulate it. So this kind of result you get when you are very precise and localizing the target properly. Actually, this was year 2006. I was also very young. <laughs> Not that year. <laughs> we go to the next patient. This is one of the patients. This was my first patient actually. I always show it. 
and I really admire this person. He's a retired army officer. When he asked me how many deep brain stimulation you have done, it was year 2000. So I said I have never done any. So then how can you do my? I have done the observation. I know the technique. If you allow me, I can do it. These are the risks. These are the benefits. He said after this, after my say, you will you know, never say that you have not done it. You do first case of mine. So this was my first case. That's a very important for me. I really admire this person. And this was the. He had the full trial of the symptoms like rigidity, tremors, and uh, disc, uh, echinacea almost. He used to have his son all the time around him to help him. Very difficult to getting out of the bed, going to the washroom. So he always required an assistant. This is after three weeks of the surgery now. Same person. So we'll see. Yeah, what's this, sir? Is it easy? How to work easy? Huh. As in easy? We'll check all his movements, like coordinated movements, fine movements. Walk. Can you go up and down? Can you go up and down? No, no, as in. Can you go up and down? एक एक करके दीजिए जल्दी 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 क्या है हाँ तो उसको लेके दूसरा कीजिए बस अच्छा आप मेरे तरफ चल के आइए हाँ यहाँ से इधर से होते हुए जाइए आप जाओ हाँ चलो पहले मैं क्या करें चलिए पहले That's how he started walking back to his normal parade walk. Are you better than the party? Yes. She was an army officer. Yes. Retired. Sir, it's a... They require good physiotherapy as well because they have a lot of rigidity. Like he's putting his hand in the person in the abdomen. Because of rigidity he had for so many years. So they require good physiotherapy after the surgery. So that helps a lot. So I'm always thankful to this guy. Now 20, 23 years since I started the deep brain stimulation surgery in India. So because of this person, people started coming to me. So another patient from Manipur recently did in year 22. Let's see. He also had very difficulty even getting out from the chair even. Always wanted the assistance to walk, to stand up, to getting out of the bed. And not even able to maintain the balance even. So he can't even stand without the assistance. This was his condition. And for last about 20 years, he was on the anti Parkinson drugs hmm. and seen no, many no, neurophysicians. One of our neurophysicians referred it to me. Uh, I would no, tell you, it's important to have a very good neurophysician around. Otherwise, very difficult to SSA. diagnose and the, who are the patients who should be referred to the neurosurgeon. Mm. Yes. Then, this is after about one and a half month. His son has sent this video to me after one and a half month of the surgery. This is at his own residence. His son is recording and sending it to me on my WhatsApp. So I put it there. So this is only last year I did. You can see him even running. In the same man who are not even able to stand up. So these are the results of the functional histotactic neurosurgery. Not many people are aware that functional histotactic neurosurgery has reached to a very high level. So I was last week I was in Dubai. We had a world congress. So indications for the functional histotactic neurosurgery and the target 
has been recognized for different diseases like drug addiction. Doria. So many of the psychiatrists must be might be interested and they might be having patients of the OCD who are not responding and the drug addiction and the depression. All of these patients are now coming up for the functional hysterectomy neurosurgery to the neurosurgery referred by the psychiatrist when they feel that the medicines are not really working well and we have gone to the very high dose, we have tried different things but the behavior changes are not coming to the, to the normal stream. These are the cases which should be referred to the functional hysterectomy neurosurgery. So we are ready to help them. Another thing is the radio surgery. You must have heard about the X knife, gamma knife, and cyber knife. So these are all machines, the name of the machine, they all give the focal radiation to the particular disease, whether it's the arteriovenous malformation or deep city small brain tumors in the development areas where we cannot operate. These are the cases which we treat with the histotactic radio surgery. And the, we have the, one of the largest series in India. These are already treated like the small, small tumors in the deep areas and the pituitary tumor is a residual small pituitary tumor after I do the transfer surgery through the transnasally. Some tumor is left close to the optic nerve or the internal carotid artery that can be treated by the histotactic radio surgery. So we are doing it regularly. Now we have the proton beam therapy also at Apollo Hospital. Another new thing which we have is Zepex. This is a machine which is has very high precision for the head and neck tumors, especially for the deep-seated brain tumors and the cervical spine tumors. So this machine has been installed at Apollo Hospital in New Delhi now. And after two weeks, I think we are going to take up our new patients. I already lined up my patients for that. And this is the first in South, East, South Asia. And I think the, we are expecting the people from all around in the South Asia to get the benefit of this machine. The best advantage of this machine is that there is no radiation exposure to the workers, the, any doctor, any medical physicist, radiation oncologist who are working around that machine. They don't need bunkers. This machine in itself is a small bunker. The patient goes inside, everything is fed in the computer on XYZ axis. The precisely this machine will give the radiation to that particular area and patient can come out of the treatment. I think that's much enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tyagi, for telling us all the advances in the field of neurosurgery, including neuronavigation or stereotactic surgery. So we will take questions at the end of both the lectures. So you can come here and then uh, I will request another moderator or my friend, Dr. Kalra. Uh, I think we all we all know that he is a great academician, so he will introduce our another second speaker. Dear friends, I think we are running a little late. I will cut short my introduction by 30 seconds. <laughs> Dr. Vivek Kumar has been my friend, my colleague at uh, Max Panchil Park also, although he has been working primarily at Max uh, Saket. So, I was thinking of them as I was thinking of them. Now, when I was watching their literature and introduction, I found him quite ahead of me. So, he has been uh, trained in international cardiology, in international cardiology, Tabard, Mitra Click at USA. Fellow of Society of Cardiology, Cardiovascular Angiography and the International uh, Society from USA. One thing I want to stress is that he discovered something very rare, a congenital venous anomaly called coronary venous cardinal vein. Sir, I want a clap. I, 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 I search on uh, Google also what it means. It's something, uh, some cardi cardiac vein, esophageal vein, and uh, uh, a vein, anastomosis, whatever. 
he will uh, enrich us. Something new I have never come across. He is alumni of uh, uh, BHU, Banaras Hindu University. Hamare Modi Sahib ka area hai. So, I will not go into what he has achieved. He is a very academic uh, uh, pillar of uh, uh, Apollo now. Earlier he was with Max Sake. So, professionally he has achieved so many awards. Sir, I would say you will apprise us something new about cardiology. Although we have heard about this like IVERS and uh, OCT and uh, newer things, the intravascular lithotripsy and so many things. Yes. Sir, anything new we will learn from you. Stay cool. Very good evening to everybody. And Dr. Kalya sir, thanks for your generous comments about me. And believe me, ये डिग्रीया रह जाएगी, but after experience, उसको हम कभी we cannot go ahead that. And इतने सारे eminent physicians, surgeons हैं यहाँ पे, it's a pleasure to be here. पिछले 12 साल से I'm doing, I'm here in Delhi. BHU से I came here as a young cardiologist. And I remember when I came here, there was a new stent launched. You must all have heard of that, absorb stent. Mm. And uh, left, right, center, almost most of the patients were having absorb. We saw patients dying suddenly, stent thrombosis happening. We, saw, we thought that it's a rare phenomenon. And uh, then further evidence came and the stent needed to be withdrawn. So it was a very costly stent, uh, but we, we learned our lessons. And the lesson was that innovations happen, but innovation, innovation should be respected and we should really choose and pick where we should use innovations. So with this background, and first of all, my regards to Dr. Chahan, the Physician Forum, for giving me this platform. I have interacted uh, at this platform previously too, uh, but uh, being at Apollo Hospital, I am uh, doing interventional cardiology, I am doing instructional heart intervention and electrophysiology there. So today I am not going to talk about IVERS, OCT and things like that. Something new that is happening and uh, uh, with a medical background that how should we decide that which are the patients uh, you should be referring to for such interventions. So, not wasting more of your time, let me start. So, structural heart intervention. We have all heard about it, Tavi, Towers, Mitra, Clayton, things like that. A lot of people are talking, cardiologists are doing this. So, what is, what, what is structural heart intervention? So, structural heart intervention is basically doing valve interventions without open heart surgery. We are doing for aortic valve, we are doing for mitral valve, we are doing it for triaspid valve, some selected cases, and as well as pulmonary valves. So we are going into the domain of surgeons, but believe me, we are partners in that, not uh, opponents or competitors. So I give you a case. So this lady, a 67-year-old diabetic female, having NYCH class 3-4 symptoms, uh, having syncope, and on echocardiography, she had a severe aortic stenosis with a gradient of about 81 mmHg. Anything about above 40 is very high and it is severely high and the valve area was just 0.52 cm. But this lady was a preserved lady and uh, if you do uh, assessment for surgery, so it, she was a low risk patient for surgery that is open heart surgery valve replacement as well as for tau. So what should we offer this patient? So let me take you to, to the guidelines, what the guidelines as of now today states about the status of tower versus sour, that is surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcapital aortic valve replacement. So you said uh, low risk surgery. Low risk for surgery, sir. 
So, so whenever we uh, give a patient an option of surgery, there are scoring three, four symptoms. Yeah, low risk for sour. That is low risk for sagittal area. That means that it's a routine patient for a cardiac surgeon, and it's a routine patient for tower. So, what should this patient be offered? Whether she should go for a surgical aortic valve replacement, or you send to me and I do a tower for this patient. So, this is this is uh, the conundrum that we are going to discuss today. So, what the guidelines say? The guideline says that if the patient is high risk for surgery, that is you know that there is more than 5 to 7 percent risk of the patient dying after or uh, uh, during or after the surgery it becomes a high risk for surgery in that scenario whatever may be the the life expectancy should be good tavi becomes the preferred option but such kind of a patient here what you do is that first of all you need to consider the age of the patient so if you consider the age of the patient and the patient is less than 65 years old, this patient should ideally be going for a open heart surgery that is surgical aortic valve. If the patient is above 80 years, for India you can keep it as 70 years, this patient becomes a candidate, an ideal candidate for a target because the surgery has good outcomes, even better than a surgical area and the, if the procedure can be done rapidly, patient can be discharged within 2-3 to three days. But in patients with, as the patient that we discussed, 67 year female, in that both surgical AVR and TAVI becomes equivalent choices. So then how do you decide? You offer the patient. So what do you offer? You say that okay, if I am going to do a TAVI, there is a 5-10% to 10 chances that you may need a pacemaker. But if you go for a surgery, there is a chance that you may need a one month of recovery. If I do a TAVI with a biopositive valve, there is an option that in future also I can do a re tavi in this patient. So what do you opt for? So all this was told to the patient and the patient agreed that she needs and she would like to have a TAVI. So we did a transfemoral artery access as routine, cross the aortic valve loaded the this is the loaded valve tavi valve uh, it was done under local anesthesia with trans uh, thoracic echocardiography guidance and the valve was deployed and after the valve deployment you can see the gradients the gradient from 91 mmhg reduced to about uh, 8 mmhg and this was the patient 24 hours after a valve surgery, a valve replacement in her room and this patient was discharged after 14 hours. So this is what a trans catheter intervention or structural heart intervention changes the uh, outcome of the patient. This was a very interesting patient, a severe AS patient, severely frail. You can see the hand of the patient, this patient had rheumatoid arthritis. This patient was referred by a surgeon, cardiac surgeon to do a TAVI. And this was after one month of TAVI, she is doing fine. And this is what, if you choose the patient, the right patient, innovations can make the life of patients and your practice uh, that you can be proud of. So coming to case number three. So we have a patient, 67 year old female, she with cardiomyopathy. EF of about 30 percent, having moderate to severe MR, and she continues to be on in-class NYHA 3-4 symptoms despite guideline-directed medical therapy, maximum to tolerable dose, CRPD already implanted. What should you offer this patient? Can the mitral valve repair help this patient or not? Yes, it can, and we have data for that, and the guidelines recommend if. The patient is having an EF of less than 50%. Patient is having a moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. Patient continues to be symptomatic despite our medical therapy. What we can do, what we call is edge to edge repair, trans catheter edge to edge repair. Where what we do is that we take this clip, mitral clip, uh, through a trans uh, femoral vein axis. We go into the RA, we puncture the interatrial septum, we go on the left side of the uh, uh, heart, that is left atrium, 
we cross the valve under transesophageal guidance, we locate the jet and what we do is just we put this clip over it. Uh, we can put multiple clips and this stops the mitral regurgitation and we have data that it improves cardiac uh, outcome. Uh, the, there is a positive remodeling, patient symptoms improve and patient's mortality is also improved. And this was the case uh, during my stay at Cleveland. Uh, so uh, yeah, three clips were needed in this patient to seal the mitral regurgitations. So valve surgery, particularly aortic valve and the mitral valve, they can, if it, uh, we choose the patient correctly, it can make very uh, satisfying difference in patient's outcome. Now, briefly about bradycardia, pacing for bradycardia. So we all know patient having uh, low heart rate, syncope, you send the patient for pacemakers. What the, so this is a patient, so this was a patient, uh, a 68 year old female, she had a TAVI done 10 months back and now she came with a high degree AV block. Should I send this, uh, do a normal conventional pacing for this patient or not? Or I should offer this patient something different? So what is the problem with conventional pacing? So over the time we have realized that what happens that in patients who have a pacemaker for a long time, they have more incidence of atrial fibrillation, they have more heart failure hospitalization and they have more heart failure symptoms. And the reason, the reason is that in conventional pacing, what we do is that we do a pacing on the right side of the heart, RV pacing. So when we do a RV pacing, we actually create a light left bundle branch block pattern activation in the heart. And what we do is that we create an iatrogenic mechanical desynchrony in the heart. You remember patients of severe LV dysfunction with left bundle branch block, we send this patient for CRTD, that resynchronization therapy. When we do pacemakers, we create desynchrony that is iatrogen. So what, why we do this? Because we, do, we didn't have any better options to offer. Because a patient who is having low heart rate, you need to give a pacemaker and the venous side is the safest uh, site where you can put a, uh, a lead and do a pacing. But today, innovation has brought something alternative and something attractive. We can do a his bundle pacing, that pacing the uh, conduction system, we can do a left bundle branch pacing and we can do a left bundle branch area pacing. So what it does, it creates, so this is the normal activation of a heart on a pacemaker. You can see that the left part of the heart is the last part to activate. So whenever you put a pacemaker, a conventional pacemaker, the LV doesn't work as a unit. The septum contracts first and the lateral wall contracts later. So today, what the guideline says. So if the patient cannot undergo a CRT and the EF is low, less than 30-35% patient, in that case, we can do a convention, we can do a conduction system pacing. And if the patient ejection fraction is less than 40%, in that patient, it's a good idea to offer such patient a conduction system pacing rather than a conventional pacing. Uh, and this is what was done. So in a conventional pacing, we put a lead here. This is the RV apex. In, conduct, so in, in conventional pacing, in conduction system pacing in this patient, what we try to do is that we try to bury the pacing lead deep into the interventricular septum so that it goes on the left side of the heart because the left bundle li lies on the left side of the interventricular septum. We penetrate the septum and we, we reach on the left side so this is, our interventricular septum is right here, the bundle of the, his is here and so in this patient when you do a uh, left bundle branch area pacing, the patient doesn't have a left bundle branch block. They show a right bundle branch block and you can see it's a very narrow QRS and a lot of people can say that it's a normal ECG. So this is interesting. What is new in hypertension? You have been treating hypertensive patients. We all know that treating hypertension is such a trouble. Why? Because of this data. About 35% patients you are treating, we, we all know by our practice that they, your blood pressure is not controlled. 
you give multiple medicines some patients may be having a true resistant hypertension when we call a resistant hypertension by definition if the patient needs three or more drugs to control the blood pressure of less than 140 by 90 including a diuretic or you need more than three drugs to control BP and in a lot of cases in 20% cases you, you never control the blood pressure to the target. This is what a resistant hypertension. What are the reasons for resistant hypertension? Two resistant hypertension can be multifactorial but a lot of time compliance becomes a very big, big issue in treating hypertension. So what if I say that there is an option you can treat such cases with an intervention. And what is that intervention? That intervention is based on physiology. One, what is this physiology? The physiology lies at the uh, level of kidneys. Kidneys are very important organ as a sensor and regulator of blood pressure. We all know the renin secretion and the renin angiotensin system activation and which is stimulated by the brain, the NTS area that gets the sympathetic output to the kidneys and what it does Whenever the kidneys receive a sympathetic output, you have renin release, you have more sodium and water retention, and you have renal vasopressin. All these are inputs that increase the blood pressure. So if I say that somehow, if we cut off this sympathetic input to the renal arteries, can we not prevent the sympathetic stimulation of kidneys? Can we not reduce blood pressure rise in such patients who are whose blood pressure is predominantly driven by sympathetic overactivity and can it be achieved? The best part is that it can be achieved Why this very innovative therapy which is available in India now it's called renal denervation. So it combines interventional cardiology and electrophysiology and you make a trait therapy what we call is renal denervation. How is it possible? Is it possible because the renal nerves, they lie around the renal arteries. So if you create a heat in the renal artery, the heat seeps outside into the adventitia. It burns the renal nerves, the sympathetic nerves, without damaging the renal artery. And this is how this treatment is done. So what we do? It's done under local anesthesia with mild LV, mild IV sedation. We need a femoral artery axis. What we do is that we define the renal anatomy. We need to see the main renal artery as well as the accessory renal arteries. And so we need a renal angiography. The procedure takes one to two hours because we have to pick and choose all the branches of the renal artery. And this is how we do, we pass this catheter, it's a very unique catheter, we call it a spiral catheter and we give 60 second burns to each segment of the renal arteries and this burn creates damage or injury to the renal nerve without damaging the renal artery and would you will really be interested to know is it effective, yes it is effective, this is the data that we have, you can expect at least 10 to 20 mm Ag reduction in blood pressure in more than 80% of the patients. There will be 10 to 15% patients who may not have this much of a reduction in blood pressure because there could be other reasons for his blood pressure. But this data is here that shows that from 12 mm Ag to 26 mm Ag over 3 years, sustained reduction in blood pressure can be achieved. So your patient whom you were having trouble controlling blood pressure even on three or more drugs and the blood pressure always remained around 160 100 you can expect that in such patients the blood pressure can be controlled to a desirable level so this therapy what it does is that you can see here that this was the baseline bp and uh, with the patients in absence of medicine and this was a trial which was done with medicine. You can see here that how does it helps to reduce the morning surge in blood pressure and this effect is all throughout the day. And this is what is great in hypertension management. All the guidelines have endorsed it. Recently it got a FDA approval for treatment for hypertension. So who are these patients you can offer such treatment? 
you can offer this patient for resistant hypertension and in patients who are not compliant enough for their hypertensive treatment. So this is my training certificate for renal denervation. So I am trained to do this procedure and uh, uh, so with this I conclude my talk. So we talked about structural heart intervention, we talked about pacing, what's new in it and what's this exciting renal denervation therapy. So uh, some words from my side, innovation in medical science is always happening around. New technology and new techniques come and will come. As a physician, our role is to use them as per the merits of the disease, not as per the merits of the innovation only. Choosing the right procedure for a disease is paramount. Considering patient factors becomes the most important determinant. One size doesn't fit all. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vaik. I think we'll start. We are already late, so I will ask only one question. Then uh, we'll first take questions from Dr. Sudhir Tyagi. Just one question, JPEX. I have heard first time your proton, when proton therapy was introduced, I know that it was the first in India, which was brought in India by Apollo Hospital in Chennai. Not even Ames, not even any other uh, corporate hospital brought it. Proton, my one of the patients who was operated in Apollo, he was referred for proton therapy in Chennai. J what is JAPEX and when will you start it and what is actual its use? Where, we, uh, what are the indications? Uh, we can, certain thing about JAPEX. JAPEX is a machine in which we can treat the patient who has a very deep seated brain tumors and the cervical spinal tumors where the surgery is not amenable or even after the surgery some small tumor is left over. So to complete the treatment the role of JPEX comes. The another advantage of JPEX is you don't need a radiation bunker for this. You don't need a big place for this. The machine itself has a radiation safety measures and the, the people who are working around like neurosurgeon, radiation oncologists and medical physicians, they can roam around the machines. If you see the gamma knife, cyber knife, or wireless, X knife, these are also a proton beam for that matter. You need a very big bunker. Bunker is like this whole room. So that radiation should not go out. But in the Zepex, in a small machine, it's the size of a man who can just go inside and itself takes care of the radiation should not go out of this machine. This is the biggest advantage. Even in Japan, the ZEPEC has been put at the metro station. So people come there and get the treatment done and go. So this is the advantage of ZEPEC. And this is the first in the Southeast Asia, not only in India. Uh, thank you. I will not ask further questions already later. Dr. Jaggi, just half a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, in uh, abbreviations, OTS and ICG. Uh, unlike Dr. Tulsi, we cannot understand what that is mean. What was OTS, what was ICG? And also, uh, you mentioned something about drug addiction. Does your DBS work there? Uh, I have many patients who want uh, to be out of drug addiction. Please. So, first thing is ICG. The indocyanin is a uh, dye which can be put intravenously. When you put the endocyanin intravenously, it will go into the whole blood in the body. And when you are dealing with a tumor which has a lot of blood supply, it will show from the where the blood supply is coming. It will make that area green. If it is coming from anterior area, you can go first to the anterior area and cut off that blood supply. It's a contrast. It's a contrast, but it shows the color. Right. What was OTS? What was that? Optical tracking system. This is for new navigation. And about drug addiction, it is. Yeah. Drug addiction is one of the indications where the medicines are not working and the detection program is not working. These are patients who can be treated by the deep brain stimulation. ICG is also used in abdominal surgery. We use it in bariatric surgery. We use it in difficult gallbladder surgery also. We can del it can delineate the duct system so you can cannot injure the CVD, it can identify the CVD in difficult cases. So, Dr. Parasar, yes. 
Yes, sir. For the cases of especially for the trigeminal neuralgia, right? They are the cases which can be easily treated on the Zepex. Where the if the patient medical condition doesn't allow the microvascular decompression surgery, there the role of the Zepex comes. No, but uh, if Zepex is non-interventional, that is, we are working from outside. So, won't it score over the interventional surgery overall? Uh, actually, the results of the microvascular decompression surgery are instant. Moment you do the surgery, result will come from the and, next day. And in Zepex? But in the Zepex, it will take some time to get the result, few months. Okay. Thank you. So it's, I think it's a new therapy and maybe comparative study, have it been done uh, with, with open surgery? Uh, Zepex versus microvascular open surgery. Yeah, the, the Zepex is required in the patient where the open surgery sometimes is not difficult. Possible. I think and very difficult, difficult or chances of complications yeah. are high. Yes, I, I am. Yes. Sir, I have a very small question, sir. Neuroglion, cerebral tumor, any answer for the Zepex to treat the, this tumor? It's a very dangerous tumor, mostly fatal, almost dead, almost here. The prognosis in the glioma depends on the grade of the tumor. If the glioma is grade 1, it is, I think, completely treatable. In grade 2, the recurrence comes about 8 to 10 years and still the reoperation can be done. And if the mitotic figures develop, then you can put the JPEX also in this patient and even then the results are good. The problem comes with the high-grade gliomas, the grade 3 and grade 4. Whatever you do, Right now, the results are not that good. After the surgery in the grade 3, even with the timozolamide and the Zepex, the result goes up to the 3.5 to 4 years. Though there are chances that you can reoperate this patient in grade 3. But in the grade 4, we are really stuck right now. And even with all the advances, the results are not very good. Thank you. Uh, sir, I would like to know, you mentioned that this machine is the first machine now in Southeast Asia which is going to be uh, set up in Apollo and it is in the process of getting set up. Uh, I would like to know the cost of uh, this therapy, sir, if you operate with this machine, what is the cost? Cost has not been defined till now, but my idea is for the international patient, I am writing the replies. So I am giving them $6,000 for the full treatment. So it crowd around 5 lakhs of Indian rupees. <laughs> much, much more cheaper than the proton beam. Okay, about 20-25 lakhs. Right. Uh, sir, I, you specialize in spine surgery. And Brain you take and spine pride in being a yeah. spine surgeon. Yeah. You have no uh, absolutely hesitation saying I am a spine surgeon. Right. Unlike many neurosurgeons who say, no, 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 don't call me a spine surgeon only. But you are one of the best spine surgeons that I know in North India. Sir, I would like to know from uh, uh, your perspective, we don't only have tumors. We have usual issues uh, on the spine uh, like intervertebral disc prolapse, osteoporotic uh, prolapses. Uh, sir, uh, what is the cost of treating those things in your setup? Because yeah. we, you have not ever showcased those kind of things in your talks. Yeah. See, in the, when I am doing the minimal invasive spine surgery, it depends on which ward the patient is getting checked in. If it is a general ward, it costs around 3.5 lakhs. If the patient goes into a semi-private, it costs around 4.5 lakhs. In single room, it is 5.5. Deluxe room, 6 lakhs. He goes to the suit where he needs a drawing room also attached to it, it costs about 12 lakhs. So it all depends how much luxury the patient is starting getting, wants to get. But I think the surgery is same, whether you are checking the general ward, whether you are checking the suit, surgery will remain the same. So it's 3.5 lakh in general ward. <laughs> so many people were asking at the back, uh, Dr. Tyagi is a classical neurosurgeon, classical spine surgeon. Sir, are you doing acute interventions like stenting, suppose there is a posterior circulation stroke and a vertebral artery uh, stenting needs to be done, are you doing those things? Yeah, see, 
the department of neuroscience is consists of neurosurgery neurology neuroradiology intervention neuropathology and neurophysiology monitoring which is intraoperative as well as the diagnostic so we have very good support of the neurological intervention we have two people with us round the clock if the patient can even the, the midnight we can do that intervention whether it is thrombolysis whether it is stenting we are ready for it okay. it's done regularly it, it, it's a 24/7 kind 24 to 7 right uh, sir uh, sir i have come across a lady young lady who was having pulsating tinnitus and it was found out to be a vascular loop around the cochlear nerve now zepex has got a role in it sir the microvascular decompression is the right answer for such patient but if the patient is having some medical illness which doesn't allow the surgery then that is the case for the zepex okay okay dr tulsi sir so uh, after those wonderful questions from our colleagues, I have some simple questions, Dr. Tiai. So, DBS indications you talked about, Parkinson's disease, what about else? As essential tremors, dystonia, MAG syndrome, epilepsy, difficult to treat epilepsy, and Tourette syndrome and OCD as well. What do you say, sir? So, I have done two patients of the epilepsy surgery, intractable epilepsy surgery, I should say. And both the patient, the son and daughter, were all the doctors, son and daughter. So one from India, one from Pakistan. And I've been lucky and God has been great. Both are doing very well. So if you localize your target properly, you have to be precise. For every disease, there is a particular nucleus in the brain. Nucleus means a particular group of neurons you have to target. So if you are targeting them properly, the chances that you will get a good result. Okay, my last two questions to you before I ask uh, Dr. Uh, Vivek, I have some questions for you. So my last two questions would be regarding, you know, uh, gene therapy for uh, neurogenerative, uh, degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease. We are talking about the ApoE4, which is the strongest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, talk us through this because as we know probably ApoE2 is a variant which protects this. So would we, can we give this through uh, uh, injection into the CSF, the gene therapy on uh, this uh, Alzheimer's, sir? Sir, this same question I ask my neurophysicians because this is the field of the neurophysician. Right. The way you are uh, inquisitive, I am also. So I ask them, but I think Till now, experimental. It's, it's still experimental, yeah. and they're not using it. What about the uh, MRI-focused ultrasound for treating and diagnosing, uh, you know, brain tumors, especially involving artificial intelligence? It's a big, uh, probably, this thing now. Yeah. So, uh, MRI, so, artificial yeah, MRI intelligence, focused ultrasound, focused ultrasound yes, for so diagnosing. Yeah. And treating brain tumors, sir. So when I started use, uh, doing the functional histotactic neurosurgery, I was using the thermocoagulation. I used to the global paradise internals, I used to the pedidoctin. So this is the another refined version of the right. ablation. In ablation, there is a particular uh, helmet and uh, you can say the particular frame in which actually precisely localized in three-dimensionally that particular nucleus in the MRI itself and from MRI, when the patient is in the MRI, you can give the focus ultrasound waves and then ablate that the, uh, it is Initially, it is very promising like the thermocoagulation and it is non-invasive. But the problem is with this also after one year or two years, the effects wear off, right. you have to make a bigger lesion. Right. So it is also, is, people are very happy with it initially actually. It is happening. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, if you permit, sir. Uh, sir, uh, sir uh, okay, okay. Uh, Naresh, uh, Dr. B.K. Gupta, sir. Sir, I have to ask a question for my friend. He is a cardiologist. I am sorry, sir. You see, we are having a lot of hypertension patients these days. And the 
divide the method which we have told is a unique thing which we were not aware of. So I have a patient recently who is a 80, 80 years of lady having very high blood pressure. She was having some symptoms of paralysis at some places which were okay and she was being treated in 40s and they did all sort of investigations, nothing came out to be positive. So they put the onus on the blood pressure which is causing this. Now, can we treat such a patient or what are the indications of such patients of hypertension where we adopt this? Sir, I think we can treat such patients. Uh, renal innervation is a treatment for primary hypertension or essential hypertension. So before doing this, we have to rule out the secondary causes of hypertension. Uh, renal Doppler ideally should be done to rule out any renal artery stenosis or renal artery uh, anomalies. But definitely we like to rule out pheochromocytomas and other endocrine reasons for high blood pressure. So if they are all negative, this patient can be treated with our renal innovation treatment and uh, uh, hoping that this, uh, this patient will benefit with this therapy. The best part is that the complication rates are very minimal and the complications are just because of the puncture site. As you know in all patients who underwent, undergo intervention like uh, angiographies and angioplasties through a femoral route, they get hematomas at the local uh, puncture site. But nowadays we have uh, learned from our mistakes and we are more smarter now. We use ultrasound guided access to the femoral arteries. So the chances of complications have reduced. So the only complication with this procedure is not with the kidneys. It doesn't impair renal function. It doesn't create any renal artery stenosis. Uh, only one percent complication could be local hematomas and bleedings. And that is the only complication. And I think uh, it's, it's a very, it, uh, hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension is an unmet need in medical therapy, I think. And that's why even uh, deep brain stimulation is coming. There are pacemakers coming up with a barrel receptor stimulation. So that's a future. But uh, we can say that this therapy can be offered for your patient. Dr. Vivek, uh, although we are late, yes, sir, uh, I would like to uh, know from you, 10 years back, there was a very uh, aggressive promotion of uh, renal innervation. I don't know what was the uh, name of that study. And it took the world with a stride. Dr. Praveen, uh, Praveen Kumar and all that. Uh, yeah, yeah. All the, they, they, they were at least 50 in a row, CMEs, we attended. And then it went in a way. It vanished. And we never talked about uh, renal innovation. Is this renal innovation newer or different from that? Please. Oh, sir. Uh, sir, I think you have really narrated this rightly. And it's a history of renal innovation. Renal innovation is nothing new. People have tried it. But as I said, that we have grown smarter. Uh, in those days, when renal uh, innovation came, the catheter was different. The target was different. Initially, what we were doing is that we were ablating around the main renal artery. So, in the trials, the results were very promising. But when it percolated to the normal world patients, real world patients, the data was not satisfactory. There were patients were not getting desired reduction in blood pressure. So, everybody went to the drawing board, and what they realized, the anatomists were involved that most of the renal nerves they are around the branches, not the main renal artery. So now, what we do is that our catheter has changed. Initially, it was a uh, simplicity catheter. Now it's a simplicity spiral catheter. Right. The size is small, and now we burn the branches as well as the main renal artery. Well, so we we do complete uh, denervation. Now. Well, I'm sorry, but we are doing it. My last one. Hai. Kisi time pe, vaccine for hypertension had also been uh, promoted initially. I don't know whether it stands. I don't know, sir. I haven't read of it. Well, I think. Sir, as I understood from your talk, you said that you are doing renal disease. Yes, sir. All right. So I'm. And, uh, some and, of and I, uh, I, when I remember that the initial CMEs which were held, I attended one by Dr. Parvin Chandra. I even attended one by Dr. Varita uh, Arora, ma'am. Uh, uh, in Aero City, uh, she had got one international speaker on this. 
I want to know what is the cost of renewal renovation in your setup? Sir, it will cost around eight lakh rupees, something like that. What? Are, how many have you done? Sir, in all over India, there are just three cases done. FD has just approved it. So I am trained to do it. So as Sir said, I am looking for my first patient. So this procedure is simple. Since I do intervention, I do renal stenting, I do ablation. So I think I am the right person to do it. Eight lakhs. Yeah. Eight lakhs. Yeah. All right. Uh, I would also like to know from you, in your practice of treating hypertension, you are an eminent cardiologist. What percentage? Can can we have some challenge, please, Dr. Gandhi, sir? Sir, only five minutes, sir. Only five minutes. Uh, in your practice, what percentage of your cases would qualify to be resistant hypertension? Sir, I think it would be around 20-30 percentage. Right. In what percentage of these cases you would offer renal denervation as an option? Sir, if I don't find that the blood pressure is being controlled, I definitely offered, in fact, I have offered a few patients. We have lined it up. But definitely, before that, it's important that we confirm that patient is drug compliant. If the patient is happy taking medicines, it's better that we continue on blood pressure medicines. So I have two patients for follow up. I have already given them options and they are considering it seriously. Meanwhile, I am just uh, tweaking their medicines and uh, I think resistant hypertension patients, we should offer this treatment. Right, sir. Uh, sir, do you still uh, believe in the definition of resistant hypertension as a patient being at least on three drugs, one of which is a diuretic? And is that being followed to the uh, split? You, you follow that in your practice? That patient must be on a diuretic before you classify this patient to be on resistant hypertension? Your view on that? Sir, definitely I think this classification is not given by me. By the international guidelines, they say this way. So we have to understand the physiology. So hypertension has multiple mechanisms. You have neural mechanism, you have renal mechanism, you have vascular mechanism. Diuretics are very important drug to control blood pressure. The reason is that they cause sodium depletion. And when it causes sodium depletion, it reduces the vasoconstriction in the peripheries. It, re it re reduces the volume overload. So basically it acts as a physiology. So before not giving a diuretic, you cannot really judge or uh, label somebody as a resistant hypertension. It's important that, okay, so what other drugs you can give? So you give CCBs, you give AS inhibitors or ARB. And the third drug is obviously a diuretic that you give. And uh, I, I, after that, what drug you should offer? So in that patients, an aldosterone antagonist, a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, is a very potent drug. So I never, never offer a patient uh, this, I will not offer such treatment to such patients before I have given a trial of uh, spinal octant to such patients. Sir, my last question. Uh, we have seen uh, the uh, evolution of uh, hypertens hypertension guidelines from DNC1 to DNC8. And we have seen a complete reversal of the guidelines right from diuretics and beta blockers being on the top to diuretics and beta blockers being at the bottom. We see a re-emergence now of beta blockers in the guidelines. I wanted your opinion on that. Sir, actually uh, the beta blocker theory or story is very interesting. Uh, as, am I, as I am aware according to the current guidelines, beta blockers are not the first line treatment for blood pressure management. Yes, it becomes blood first line drug. If the patient is having tachycardia, if the patient is having CAD, if the patient is having CHF. Apart from these three criteria or indications, you don't have a criteria of beta blocker. Reason why do you want, don't want to give beta blockers? The reason is that most of these beta blockers, they don't reduce the central aortic pressures. So though you may be measuring the lower blood pressure, your patient will be having higher blood pressure, the central aortic pressures will be higher and the trials have shown that even uh, such patients are getting more stroke. So the dictum of medical therapy is that you should not do something which harms the patient. So the only reason you should not use a beta blocker because you may be harming this patient unless uh, until you have a very pertinent indications. So I don't think beta blocker is first line treatment. I think CCPs, ARAs, ARBs and diuretics, uh, I think that becomes the first line treatment. Dr. Uh, Tulsi sir, uh, Dr. Narendra Singh sir, Dr. Tiagi, there is a patient of me, uh, uh, I 
have a question from Dr. Narendra Singh. There is a patient of me who is, when we did this uh, CT angiography of the brain contrast, we found there is a 50% uh, stenosis of the left internal carotid artery and 70% stenosis in the petro same uh, internal carotid artery in the petrochemonus area. Do you think that the patient, uh, any interventional way should be treated by putting stent or not? Any, what was his presentation? Presentation is, uh, he has got other issues like uh, uh, this channelopathy uh, issues, like uh, he has got familial hemiplegic migraine and he, as well as he has got this other issue of uh, like this uh, uh, cerebral spinal ataxia, atypical ataxia type 2, for which the genetic uh, testing is being also done. So internationally, the protocol which we follow, uh, up to 70 percent, the patient can be treated with the medical management. Okay. We have to just put on the eco spring with along with the uh, atorvastatin. Okay, okay. If the it is goes more than 70 percent, yeah. then definitely they are the patient for the intervention. And uh, we have good intervention technique. Not only stenting, we have the flow diverters now, which can be used anywhere in the brain. What is that, sir? Flow diverter is another uh, kind of a stent which is very malleable, which can put in the different uh, vessels which are actually branching and uh, even there it can be put. It can be put in the paternus cavernous area? Cavernous area also. As well. Okay. Yeah, the stent is difficult to put in the cavernous area, but flow diverter can be put. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Mangla sir, I think, uh, Dr. Narendra Singh, most of the questions you ask, I have observed, is already treated by somewhere else, somewhere else especially. So if you tell us what was done, next time it will be better. Because I, I have observed, most of the questions you ask, it has been treated by somewhere else. And you are checking. No, there is no harm, but you let us know what was actually done and what was the result. I know, I know. Uh, Dr. Mangla, Dr. Mangla. No, I was uh, asking, in the sympathetic denervation, uh, once there is a response, how long is it sustained? Sir, uh, with the current? And uh, 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 do they become off drugs, these patients? So, sir, uh, they were on three drugs, four yeah, drugs. Yeah. So, not all patients will be off drugs. As I said that blood pressure, hypertension is a multifactorial. It just cuts off the sympathetic uh, pathway of hypertension. It doesn't cut off the vascular, it doesn't uh, cut off the uh, other factors that uh, influence hypertension. Uh, you can expect the patients to become uh, off drug in less than 50% cases. So more than 50% cases will remain on uh, blood pressure medicines, yes. The pill burden will be reduced. You can expect a better blood pressure control in such patients. Uh, important in blood pressure management is controlling the blood pressure to desired level because if you continue on medicines and the patient remain to be higher than expected uh, blood pressure range, you are going to have patients having uh, adverse outcomes like heart attacks and stroke. So in that regard, it's a beneficial treatment. Look, before labeling them as resistant hypertension, do you uh, do you do a sleep study in these patients? Sir, ideally, what we do is that we do a 24-hour BP monitoring, and uh, we check the compliance of the patient. That is, he compliant on the blood pressure treatment or not? So, I just love to share you something that internationally, particularly in Thailand and Japan, what is happening is that patients are coming. Uh, as an option, uh, coming for this treatment as a first treatment for uh, hypertension management. Why? Because they think that I don't want to be on medicines for lifelong. This treatment is permanent because we know that nerves don't regenerate. So correct me if uh, I'm not wrong. So nerves don't regenerate. So when the nerve is burnt, it will never regenerate. So the sympathetic in, uh, input to the kidneys is, is gone forever. So uh, uh, in these trials even, there were patients who were not on medicines, uh, but they opted for uh, renal denervation and they, were, uh, they didn't need blood pressure treatment. But for resistant hypertension, 
not all patients. So I have got inputs from one to two patients here uh, 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 that has been done in India. So uh, the BP reduction has been in the range of 20 to 25 mm HG. Right. So it's a very, very, uh, so if the patient is 160 by 100, you can expect that the patient will be in a normal range. So this is what you can expect. And these patients of CKD, no, I'm not talking about renal artery stenosis. Do you treat these patients? Sir, yeah. at the moment, uh, at the moment, the guidelines have not is not recommending that uh, because it's it's pretty early in the treatment. So I started with the absorb absorb story. Why? Because when absorb happened. Almost all patients were started getting treated by MI patients were getting treated. So now we are cautious. We have learned our lessons. So at this moment, CKD patients can be treated, and in trials they have been done. But we still have to wait for the data. You didn't answer whether uh, all these patients should undergo sleep study. So definitely, definitely. So as I said, that we have to rule out secondary hypertension. So if the patient is having OSA, this is not the treatment for him. Because if we, we don't correct the OSA part, this treatment will fail. So definitely sleep study is needed if the patient is having history of uh, suspected uh, OSA. Definitely. Dr. Bhaskar Shukla, neurologist, has a question. Sir, my question to Dr. Deep Thay. Uh, sir, uh, nice presentation. Sir, I just wanted to uh, know a very uh, specific. Uh, I had one patient, a very young male, uh, who had CVT. He presented in the ER uh, with very severe headache and vomiting. We did the scans, uh, MRI. The MRI did not show any parenchymal abnormality. We did the contrast venogram and it showed a deep CVT, deep straight sinus thrombosis. And uh, we managed him. With the anticoagulation, we uh, started him on uh, Clexane 0.6 ml twice daily. And then uh, we just discharged him, he became symptomatically better on Debigatron. Debigatron 150 mg twice daily. As for the respect CBT guidelines, which uh, endorses that uh, uh, DOAX are equally good as the uh, this warfarin or acetron. So he did fine and he was doing okay only. And uh, after a few days, or I would say, I should say a few weeks, he again uh, landed in the ER with again a very severe headache and vomiting, etc. We did the scans again. This time, uh, his scans showed a small infarct in the parietal area, right parietal area to be specific, and progression of the clot. Despite I checked his drug personally, he was taking Dabigatran 150 mg and that too a very good brand, Pratexa. Uh, but despite that, there was progression of clot. Uh, he developed uh, clot in the. I mean, initially it was in the straight sinus, but now it has progressed to the uh, uh, the uh, proximal third of the superior sagittal sinus, left sigmoid sinus, extending up to the uh, uh, IJB also. And uh, so I was wondering. So. Despite taking all these drugs, he had this progression and the patient was still symptomatic and severe, very severe headache, vomiting, etc. And uh, so, sir, my question is, uh, what is the role of a thromboaspiration in such patients? Yeah. See, there are two things. First, such patients should not be discharged too early. Because the hydration part is really important in these uh, patients. We advise good hydration. Yeah, but we should not discharge such patients. Okay. At least one week admission okay. is required. You can just give, you cannot give this medicine and you go. You see for two days and you go away. Definitely, they are going to land up in the problem. So better to keep in the hospital, put in the IV fluids, maintain the good hydration. That is the first thing. Second thing, if the patient is not responding to the medical treatment, proper aspiration is a very good indication in these cases and should be done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, would you, uh, no, no, Dr. Shukla, uh, and, and Dr. Diyagi, sir, would you like this patient to be on anti-epileptics? Anti sir, yeah, we, we, we started him on anti-epileptic also because we had some doubt that he had some seizure-like event. So he was on anti-epileptic. You didn't mention that, that's right. Ah, Levitaracetam, 500 mg twice daily, he was already on in this drug. His question was very specific, so I think the anti-epileptic is a part of the thing. Yeah. 
the measure should know that if the patient of this type anti-epileptic in the month, that is the bottom line. Uh, I would like uh, Dr. Kulsi uh, sir to ask the to ask the last question and we wind up. Only I give Dr. Tulsi sir only two minutes. Just two minutes sir? Give me five minutes sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Vivek, after so wonderful questions from our learned colleagues. Uh, I was, you know, talked about structural heart disease and uh, renal denervation therapy in registered hypertension. I was looking forward to your uh, words of wisdom. See, regarding uh, at least, uh, you know, the cardiology advances uh, as far as the uh, ACC and the AHA, recently concluded AHA in Philadelphia just 10 days back, which they talked about, you know, at least... Uh, they talked about the recent advances, see, regarding uh, mitra clip, for mitral regurgitation and the watchman device for the, um, the prevention of uh, you know strokes in uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, so about these two and what about the you know father and my father's ego? Now the three D egos are you know uh, probably defining the way you treat and the way you diagnose heart diseases. Talk us through these sir, recent uh, advances. Definitely, sir. I would like to. So three D ego is now very much a part of our practice. Uh, most of the cases 2D echo is sufficient. Whenever we are doing something on the mitral intervention, so I showed that case of mitral clip. So in that 3D echo is a very essential component because when we are putting in the clip, we need a three-dimensional assessment how much of the leaflet we are catching. So it's totally dependent on 3D echo. So uh, it's, it's very important that we use it. Regarding watchman device, uh, I'm sorry I missed that. I should have shared that too also. But definitely in patients of AF who are at high risk of having intracranial bleeds and at the same time are having high chax facet score, that is more than two, that is that makes them vulnerable to have stroke. So we have patient, if you give anti-correlation, the patient will bleed. If you don't give anti-correlation, the patient will get stroke. In such patients, we have two devices now. One is watchman device, and that is uh, uh, it's like a, it's just like umbrella-like device. And we have another device which is called emulate. So they, what we do is that we go through the venous axis the same way as we go for the mitral clip, and we plug the left atrial appendix because 95 percent of the clots they generate from the left atrial appendage in patients of AF. So, so panic implant yeah. to the left atrial appendage. Yeah. Okay, so talk us through the wrist-worn treponin, see, which is now becoming a game changer in ED, emergency department, the wrist-worn treponins. Sir, treponins we are using and there are a lot of protocols there. But I, I, apart from that, I would like to highlight the role of CT coronary angiography in today in the ED. In internationally, most of the places, troponins take time to rise. No, and sir. Uh, talking about wrist worn. See, this is a, this is a recent so, uh, this thing. This I'm not aware of. That. In the recently concluded Philadelphia conference, I may have that part, in AHA. So this this is a bloodless biomarker. See, which, uh, uh, you know, estimates your treponin levels, especially if you're coming to an ED with a chest pain, and you don't know whether chest pain is because of uh, ACC or anything else. So, wrist-borne uh, treponin, which is a bloodless biomarker, which was recently presented Sir, I think in Philadelphia. how relevant it will be for our practice, because in, in ED, whenever a patient comes with chest pain, and the duration is less than two hours, we seldom get a troponin high which is high. So now that in ED it has become a practice to send such patients for CT coronary angiography. So if you don't see an ECG changes, the troponin I troponins are normal, but you suspect that this patient could be having a ACS, it's better to do a CT coronary angiography than waiting. My last two questions because the paucity of time talking about the DEPA MI trial. See, can, could you give DEPA an acute MI within 10 days of having an MI? 
See, this was recently published again in the AHA conference. And the second question would be regarding the select trial, which was on semaglutide, non-diabetic patients, reduced mortality, cardiovascular mortality, all-cause mortality, but 20%. Talk us regarding these two land breaking I think these are trials. These. We, uh, these drug innovations are really interesting that yeah. is happening. Yeah, very good. So semaglutide, as you know, it's the mechanism is that it is uh, uh, we have GLP and a lot. So basically, they mimic the action of uh, glucuron-like peptides. And the best part is that they have effects which are pleiotropic. They they have effects on the heart. So even in non-diabetic patients. We are seeing some positive results, but I think more data is needed before we inculcate it. 17,000 and odd patients, over two years trial. Enough data, sir. <laughs> thank you. But, but, but thank we you. have to wait for the cost factor also. Thank you, Dr. Tulsi, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Emil Kalra, sir. Thank you, Dr. Padar, sir. Very good. Dr. Sudhir Tyagi, sir. And Dr. Vivek. Very good. Uh, wonderful, wonderful CME. I would uh, request them to come here for a for a group photograph, please.